This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 93, recorded on December 4th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hey, how are you doing? I'm well, and you? I'm glad to say that we got some rain in San Diego. That's wonderful. Significant rain, so if it were to happen again about 10 times, we may be out of the drought. Oh, well, good luck. Yeah. Is it still raining now? No, no, it's nice. Here it's freezing, you know, we're into winter. Oh, boy. You probably don't miss the uh, cold weather, right? Well, at, at times I do, you know, yeah. changes of seasons are nice. Remember shoveling snow and ice and all that yeah, stuff? Well, don't re- yeah, well. <laughs> also joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How are you? I'm doing well today. See, Good. I got it right. I'm I'm not picking on you or anything. It's just a knee jerk reaction. That's right. <laughs> the, the grammar police. And here it's freezing. It's is it probably it's I would guess in your neck of the woods it's fifty five degrees, Michael. It's beautiful today. It's about sixty five. Nice. And the sun is out. Uh, we had San Francisco like fog for the last two days. Huh. Rolls in as the sun goes down and stays with us all night and. Mm. Um, and then it, it promotes mold growth on your houses. So uh, we'll be pressure washing at Christmas to get the the poor little black mold that likes to grow on paint off of yep, our houses. Yep. Well, we had uh, planned on having Michelle join us, but um, I can't reach her by Skype. So perhaps she will join us uh, as the show is in progress, as they say. But let's get started. I wanted to start off with a, a brief mention of Willie Bergdorfer, who passed away not too long ago. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, did either of you know Willie? Mm. I think I met him once when I went um, up to Connecticut. A group of us from Stony Brook took the ferry across. Yeah. So he was a uh, medical entomologist who discovered the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. Mm. He worked in uh, Which Hamilton. Which is now named after him, of course. Borrelia burgdorferi. Yeah, it's nice. And they have a wonderful picture of him in the New York Times uh, working in 1954, inoculating ticks. And um, he's got a white lab coat on and a shirt and a tie. See? And his hair is nicely combed. And he's not wearing gloves, of course, because back then none of us wore gloves. They were expensive. Yeah, they weren't disposable, right? No. Nope. Well, anyway. you could get this, the surgeons had disposable latex gloves. Yeah, back but, then they're expensive. And they were all like latex too. Yeah. And that's where people began to appreciate latex allergies. Well, anyway, he um, began to he was working in Hamilton, Montana at the uh, NIH laboratory there, which I visited Rocky this Mountain. year, Rocky Mountain Labs, yeah. And he discovered the spirochete as the cause of Lyme disease, which had had been recognized in the 70s first in Connecticut where the name came from, Lyme in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So he was 89 years old. A good long life. Okay, now uh, Elio, I believe, has a snippet for us. Right. The snippet is a little bit of nice biology that we run into and which does not need a lengthy presentation. So mine is about the... uh, ectosymbiotic bacteria, that is bacteria which are symbionts outside of cells, in this case of an insect called the bee wolf wasp, which affects, which affects bees. Anyhow, the point of the paper has to do with transmission of, the, of a bacterium uh, to the progeny. And how is this done? How do these wasps all acquire this uh, symbiont. The authors of the paper are Carlton Poth, Rosa Muller, Kohler, Peterson, Nechitailo, 
Stubblefield, Herzner, Seeger, and Strom. The symbiont, by the way, is a streptomycete, which makes antimicrobial agents, which are protective to the wasp. In other words, these are agents, which, these are antibiotics, which kill fungi and bacteria and keep the wasp from getting infected by other things. So it uses a bacterium to get rid of bacteria and viruses. This is not an uncommon theme because it recurs in the leaf cutting ants, which our readers will know all about. These are the guys in the tropics who collect uh, bits of leaves and flowers and take them to their huge underground uh, nests where they don't eat them. That's not what they do. They chew on these uh, bits of vegetation and fertilize it with their own feces and saliva and make f- gardens which on which they grow fungi. And it's the fungi which they eat. Now, as many readers know, there's a problem because this compost that you make is terrific for the growth of other fungi. And so the uh, ants would be hard put to eat the wrong fungus, and what they have in order to avoid that is they have covered on their skin layers of a different streptomycete and actinomycete, which make antibiotics which are antifungal. So again, the theme is you use a bacterium and an actinomycete to make antibiotics. Actinomyces, by the way, are well known for making a whole slew of uh, the antibiotics that are in common use. So uh, one aspect of the story that I would like to bring up is that if you asked most people, where do you expect to find symbiont, bacterial symbionts in insects, the answer probably would be in the gut, wouldn't it? Isn't that what you would think of? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would have voted termites or, or okay, suggested termites. Right. Yeah, but any insect. If I tell you yeah. insects are carrying uh, symbiotic bacteria, where would you find them in the gut? Well, it turns out That's true, but incomplete because there are plenty of cases where they are not found in the gut. I already mentioned one, the leaf-cutting ants carry the antibiotic-making bacteria on their skin. Uh, Another case which just came up, and I mentioned this sort of because it's so exciting, is the case of the shipworms. Uh, Shipworms are the uh, sort of mollusks. They're little clams, essentially, elongated mollusks, which used to be a terror to the, to the ship, to ships, to wooden ships, because they go into the wood and chew it up hmm. and make holes in the, in the ship. This was a disaster. This is why they were copper clads, uh, That's right. sailing ships, hmm. to avoid that, which was expensive and difficult to do. Anyhow, it turns out that, of course, there are bacteria which can chew on, on wood, and this is how these guys make a living. They, and so, so where are the bacteria? <laughs> well, of all things, they're on their gills. Hmm. They're carried on the gills of these um, mollusks, bivalves, and there is a strange uh, mechanism whereby the enzymes which they make in the gill, the bacteria make enzymes which chew on, on wood. They make them in the gills and they transport it. They swallow them down and they take them down to the intestine, which is in fact where the wood gets, gets um, chewed up. So this is really, mm. uh, it, it may be worth a snippet someday because this is a good story. Anyhow, but let's go back then to the um, bee wolf wasps. An interesting name, bee wolf Anyhow, they have uh, streptomyces bacteria. When I say streptomyces, that's the genus. The group to which they belong are the actinomyces, but many, many of our listeners know that. Anyhow, these streptomyces they carry make at least nine antibiotics, okay? And these are strange compounds which go by the name of streptochlorin. I'd never heard of and hmm. P periocidin, which, of which there are many. And these are, of course, complicated organic molecules, and they make this in uh, amounts sufficient to protect them against not just pathogenic fungi, but also bacteria. Interesting, the same compounds work on bacteria 
and on fungi. However, they work on different ones. And it's only when you have the mixture of all nine that you have complete coverage. Mm. So this is like doing a, what's the word for this, Michael? In human medicine, when you do a, you have several antibiotics used at the same time. It's multi-drug therapy or okay. synergism. Or- okay, right. Anyhow, so the question is, how are these passed on? Uh, by the way, the uh, my colleagues, Christoph Weigel, who writes on the blog with me and wrote a little piece about this, pointed out that the bacterium has not been cultivated in the lab. Therefore, it's called candidatus. I think we went over that mm. once. If right. you cannot cultivate a bug, you call it candi- a candidate. Okay? So anyhow. It's insulting, he right? Says, he says, bone, they're being cultivated. <laughs> Just that we're not being cultivated by humans. They're being cultivated by wasps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he's got a point. Anyhow. Well, I, don't know, I don't know if that, that counts. <laughs> Cultivated by it's wasps. Tongue, it's tongue in cheek, let's say. Oh yes, it's definitely tongue in cheek. <laughs> but I, I anyhow. So uh, what happens is that by doing a phylogenetic analysis and relating it to time of dispersion, the time when different taxa went their own way, you can find out when these events happen, and you can and you are facilitated because there are some fossil wasps you can find and not many but you can find fossil wasps which you can of course time precisely so you have a clock that you can use to determine when was what and according to this the um, relationship was established in the cretaceous time which is how many years ago mm. uh, long time it's at least 68 million years, million years ago yeah. so these guys these wasps or their ancestors rather and uh, these bacteria and their ancestors have gotten together 68 million years ago, and they've been, li- been living happily ever after. So where are they? I, I just brought up. Are they in the intestine? No. They are in the antenna. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I thought I'd get a rise out of that. Yeah. So it turns out that if you look at the antenna of these wasps, they are made of, uh, think of a bamboo. Okay, it's made of cells, right, with uh, uh, sections which are delineated by a cross wall, right? Well, this is the way these antennas are, only they're not hollow. They're, they're filled with liquid or, or tissue, but they have these segments. So an antenna is not a single tube or a single stick, but it's a collection of little compartments. And in those compartments, these bacteria grow happily. Now, they, I'm not quite sure that they know where the food comes from, but somehow they live happily there. Uh, there must be a mechanism for feeding the antenna. Anyhow, uh, they make the anten- these, these uh, little uh, segments have little uh, openings, and the bugs can come out. And this is how they are spread. That is when a, um, a wasp lays its eggs, uh, it will... Come, come out of the antennas will come out some of the liquid or paste-like material, which is then smeared inside the cell in which they lay their egg and in which the larvae, uh, they're called brood cells, and this is where the larvae uh, grow, and the larvae will take up the bacteria from there, and they will incorporate it into its cocoon, and uh, they are protected from infection there. And of course, months later, when the females... Uh, come out of the cocoon, they will acquire the bacteria and put them in their in their in their antenna. So you know, Elio, when 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 I read the portion about they acquired this bacterium during the the egg incubation phase, it, it reminded me of chicken eggs and how when a chicken egg is laid, often salmonella is inside the egg or on the shell of the egg as it's excreted from from the uh-huh. back end of the chicken. Mm, yeah. And if you recall some of the work that Roy Curtis has done with vaccines um, for chickens using salmonella, I, I almost thought that, you know, the parallelism to, to this of having a good bacterium for this larva that actually would protect it during its, its brood phase, 
you could see how the, the, the parallelism to Curtis's work where he inoculates the freshly hatched chick with his sal- Salmonella gallienellum or whatever he happens to be using to do the vaccine for the chicken. But this is, is, is where Mother Nature and modern molecular biology are drawing parallels to, to one another. And, and here the, the insect is actually ahead of us. By the way, that's true, but keep in mind that uh, most insects live in uh, symbiotic association with bacteria. That's that's true, unlike the chicken. So this is true. This is true for most insects. At some point, they have to acquire the bacteria and pass it on to the next generation. Uh, By the way, what is odd in reading is that most of these symbiotic bacteria of insects are actually ectosymbionts. I thought a lot, I, I'm more familiar with the endosymbionts, which are like the um, uh, bacteria which are in bacteriocytes, which are specialized cells, and the aphids are the best example of that because they carry bacteria which supply some of the amino acids which the aphids cannot obtain from their amino acid poor diet, namely plant sap. So transmission, vertical transmission and horizontal transmission both happen. And uh, the paper actually makes a bit, a big, a bit, it's a, big, a bit of an analysis of the evolutionary consequences of horizontal versus vertical transmission. But one of the things they did, they did a very neat experiment in addition. Namely, they infected, uh, I guess, larvae, sterile larvae with uh, the bacteria that are normally there, and they, of course, carry through the cycle. That is, they go through the uh, eventually to the antennae, and they are found in the antenna segments. If you do this with another actinomycete, which is not homologous, that is, it's not what you find, it does actually grow inside of the antenna. But guess what? It does not come out. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a strange mechanism used by the insects to select for the transmission of the desired insect and a desired bacterium and not for the transmission of the Mm. non-desirable one. So this is where the story gets interesting and I thought it was a nice piece of sort of general biology studied very well by these people. That's very neat. Now, Elio, are there any examples of of this happening in people, in humans, do our microbiome secrete um, antimicrobial compounds that protect us? I think Michael is. You should ask this of Michael. He probably knows better than I do. I'm not aware of it. But what well, do you think, Michael? Well, there's there's chemical warfare going on in our guts all the time. There are, you know, the gram positives in our gut make the small bioactive peptides that. Um, you know, control the population and trim. We can only look to the literature that's emerging about the demilitarized zone between our colonocyte layer mm. and uh, the microbial population that there's that 50 micron demilitarized zone that you and I were at the general meeting, Vincent, mm-hmm. we were sitting next together and she was describing that remarkable demilitarized zone. Um, and so I think there are probably similar microbes that are that are making antimicrobials that are actually controlling the dynamic in this this population, but nowhere near, I think, to the elegance that we've seen with this antenna system, where as the organism lays its egg, it's it's making certain that the microbe has vertically acquired the next generation is actually acquired. But you know, the literature is emerging about the final stages of gestation and how humans for a long time were thought to be born sterile. And now the the OB literature is the OB micro literature is emerging saying that um, there are data illustrating that the placenta is being colonized and the infant is being colonized by the mother during that final trimester. And I I haven't done an exhaustive review of that literature to see how clean those papers are to really know whether or not it's vertically transmitting to the fetus or it's just accidentally uh, associating. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that may be a good good subject to take up in the new year to to look at this, to draw the parallel to this snippet that Alio brought to us today and and see what's actually going on with, with humans. I think it's one of the more important aspects of thinking about it because of the amount of antibiotics that we're using. Many women who happen to be colonized for uh, strep algalactiae are, of course, given antibiotics to cure them of that. So the uh, crib death won't happen where you uh, prevent that uh, meningitis from being transmitted to the fetus. And so, you know, all of these things are are subject to reinterpretation now that we're getting appreciation of how important the microbiome is to developing humans and developing animals in general. And don't forget the virome is important too. Oh, no. I, I was waiting for, for you to bring that up. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, we really need to begin to uh, – and that's why I like the term microbiome. We're not calling it the bacteriome. We're, we're truly calling it the microbiome where we include everything that we can't see, whether it be viruses, protozoans, um, bacteria, even fungi. Yeah, but the, but the Human Microbiome Project just looked at 16S of ribosomal RNA of bacteria. Well, I can't, archaea, help, it right? that, I can't <laughs> help it that the NIH didn't really <laughs> appreciate what microbes were. Well, you know, the problem is that you can you can use a universal primer for for ribosomal RNA, but there's no such thing for viruses. You have to go this, after. This is true. So it makes it a lot harder. So people back off. They do the easy things first, which is fine. You know, I'm not criticizing. But uh, a paper just came out that we did on TWIV last week, showing that you guys probably know that in mice without bacteria in their gut, the gut's very abnormal. Mm -hmm. You can restore the function by yeah, infecting the mice with a norovirus, an RNA virus. It's crazy. It's just totally crazy, right? So I think we need to expand what we're looking at because I know it's hard to do the virome, but clearly, if you get one, one example like that, there must be many, many others all over the place. Well, you know, as we explore, um, we, we had an obituary earlier today about Bergdorf, but uh, uh, Norm Willett recently passed away and I participated in the writing of his obituary that's going to appear in Microbe with Toby Eisenstein. And Norm was always a strong proponent at the general meeting to have uh, merged topics. The one that immediately comes to mind that Elio remembers is the whole emergence of microbial endocrinology. There was that great session about, mm -hmm. I guess now about 10 yeah. years ago. And I think this would be ideally for the general meeting planning committee. This would be a topic area where, you know, considering considering the virome and the microbiome together to really begin to lay out the literature for the audience and and give them clever ways to think about doing some new science. Um, may may be a, a a neat way of of approaching this when and really used with the meeting. Meetings are good for us to be, you know, controversial and and provocative, so that the audience really leaves there going, "Hmm, I'm going to go back to lab and get busy." All right, Michael, you have a paper for us. Tell us about it. I do. Um, the paper I'm going to bring us is from the journal Biological Chemistry in issue 38, volume 289, that appeared on the 19th of September, 2014. Unfortunately, it won't go open access until. Uh, May of this upcoming year, but the title is Centerobdites elegans recognized as a bacterial quorum sensing signal molecule through the AWC ON or ON neuron and AWC stands for the, uh, I just lost it, the amphid sensory neuron is what the AWC stands for, the Amphid Sensory Neuron. The story is, uh, oh, and the paper is by uh, a group out of Princeton, and the authors are Werner, Perez, Gosh, Semmelhock, and uh, it's from the laboratory of Bonnie Basler. And the story is straightforward, but it's absolutely fascinating and, again, strives home for me this concept or the notion that we all need to seriously consider when we're going to the doctor asking for an antibiotic, and that's, you know, antibiotic stewardship, using the right drug only when necessary for 
uh, the proper period of time. And, and you'll get my gist about why antibiotic stewardship keep in the back of your mind. So first, the background. Uh, Centerobitis elegans is a cute little nematode. And I put up a picture of it in the show notes so you can see this beautiful little creature. And generally, in the lab, you feed them good old E. coli in the form of HB101. I first saw this microbe, uh, or it's not actually a microbe. I can see it with the unaided eye uh, in Tom Blumenthal's lab at Indiana University when I was a graduate student. And the results of this paper, the bacterium Vibrio cholera, uh, produces a quorum sensing signal molecule called CAI1, which C. elegans detects through this amphid sensory neuron or AWC on. And the conclusion that the authors reach doing this very elegant work is that C. elegans uses bacterial produced molecules as cues. And these molecules are also physiologically significant because they're making them to do quorum things uh, to the bacteria. And Vibrio cholera molecule, the CAI1, enables this cross-kingdom chemical interaction or communications that actually benefit uh, the worm. With the, so, uh, with, with the worm, C. elegans, which is a soil-dwelling worm, yeah. would it encounter Vibrio, Vibrio in the wild? Um, or is this, likely. or is this a theoretical construct? Uh, Vibrio, well, I always have appreciated as a waterborne, yeah. but you know, in in areas like Bangladesh, where it floods, or places like that, yeah. floods, and the the worm is tolerant to high salt. I could see uh, Bangladesh getting flooded and. It getting washed in them in the vibrio being a, a food source. So let's get started with, with the paper. We know that bacterial group behaviors are governed by quorum sensing, in which bacteria produce and release these low molecular weight molecules, and then they detect these extracellular signaling molecules upon their return. It's principally via diffusion. So the bacterium is throwing these gifts out into the environment. And then it's just diffusion kinetics that that the microbe is relying on in order to sense the quorum. And the term quorum sensing was not coined until 1994 when uh, Pete Greenberg, Clay uh, Fuqua, and Steve Wins wrote a review that appeared in, in the journal Bacteriology in, in 1994. And that's where they came up with uh, quorum sensing. And the field of quorum sensing was ostensibly um, founded, if you will, or started by Pete Greenberg when he was working on luminescent bacteria from the genus Vibrio. His, his graduate student, um, Heidi Kaplan, said about finding out how these auto-induction signals enter and leave bacterial cells, and they thought there was going to be some magic mechanism. And um, I was lucky and heard Pete tell this story. And, and then I got refreshed with this when I went out and found Pete's bio off on, uh, on the web. And what Kaplan found is that the signal or the quorum sensing, these low molecular weight molecules, and in the case of the Vibrio, there's a canonical uh, molecule that's typically a homoserine lactone, which is a low molecular weight. And Kaplan found that this was transmitted by means of, of passive diffusion. And that this very simplicity makes it a, a quorum sensing molecule because you, you're governed by the laws of, of diffusion kinetics. And as Greenberg's quote in his bio says, accumulation in the environment is reflected by intracellular accumulation. And so quorum sensing bacteria simply donate or excrete these signaling molecules that accumulate in the environment. And when the population reaches this critical density – it can influence the environmental signal concentration and thus cellular concentration. You activate operons. And in the case that Greenberg was originally working on, Vibrio fischeri, the signal activates uh, the transcription of, of luminescent genes. So he had a cause well, and effect. So now keep all well, of that. But let, me, let me refer to a, it's, it's a side issue. So 
excuse the digression, but there's somebody did an awfully clever experiment. Namely, they confined the bacterium to a very narrow space, just enough for the bacterium to be there. And of course, under those conditions, the local concentration of the autoinducer is sufficient. Mm -hmm. So this one bacterium constrained from keeping from keeping its autoinducer from diffusing away induces itself. I thought, do you remember who did this? This was not long ago. It's a very, very elegant experiment. And it really nails the diffusion argument. It right. really, really nails it. And I don't. I remember reading it, but I can't for the life of me remember who who did it. I'll I'll have to do some hunting and see if I can put it in the show notes. That'd be nice. So. We now know that quorum sensing, especially in these Vibrios, and and now we're – so the bulk of this work was done um, – you know, it started in 94 with Greenberg's lab w working on in Vibrios. And then Barbara Gluski, another ASM past president, began to work on the quorum sensing in the pathogen Pseudomonas. And Pete and um, – Barbara collaborated, and there was those elegant science papers in in the late nineties. I should also out. mention. I, mean, I should also mention that the phenomenon was really first discovered by Woody Hastings and uh, collaborators. And Woody passed away recently. He was a great guy. Oh yeah, that's right. And Pete does does uh, tribute him in some of the early that's work right. of the original papers. So. Now jump ahead uh, from 1994 to 20 years later to 2004 and a lot of groups out there and Basler's group is one of the preeminent laboratories working on, on quorum sensing. And so we know that quorum sensing, especially in the Vibrios, and we now know from lots of papers that microbes can produce multiple autoinducers auto that have specific functions, activate specific operons, et, et cetera. And so these autoinducers they send forth where they uh, enable typically intra-species communication, taking a sense of the number of their brethren that are present. And as Elio alluded to, the great e experiment showing when you tie up uh, a quorum sensing producer in a little tiny box and ask can it induce itself, the answer is yes, simply because it's not diffusing away. And so this auto inducer is going out into the environment. Now, Vibrio cholera is, as many of our listeners know, is a pathogen that causes endemic diarrheal disease uh, and it causes the clinical condition known as cholera. And this micro produces two of these magic auto inducers, which are based on the canonical molecule found in gram negatives, which is this homoserine lactone. Gram positives also do quorum sensing, but they're typically small peptides. And the first for the intragenera communication in the paper that uh, Werner and colleagues are talking about is a molecule called hydroxy tridecan 4 one or CAI-1. And the interspecies autoinducers is 2-methyl-2334-tetrahydro-tetrahydroferan borate, which is 22,4-S for short. So you can understand and by the way, why. It's interesting <laughs> that you find boron uh, in many of these molecules, in some of these molecules, and that's sort of in a biological oddity. You don't think of boron as being an element found in biology much. No, and it's, I think, because of its chemistry and and they're typically – and this is a biochemistry paper and there's a lot of biochemistry that I'm going to do short shrift on simply because biochemistry is not very radiogenic. <laughs> At least I haven't <laughs> been able to figure out how to make biochemistry radiogenic. So now these autoinducers – um, work and they typically interact with a receptor molecule that is internal to the cell and when the concentration achieves its threshold, uh, density diffusion takes over and the autoinducers do, do something. So that's what's happening in the bacteria. Now here's where the twist in, in this manuscript comes to is the nematode uh, C. elegans responds to chemicals produced by its prey and its prey are live bacteria. And these chemicals uh, that are produced by the bacteria stimulate a function in the worm, principally to lay eggs, 
move towards food or chemotaxis, eat the prey, and then, of course, defecate. So the quorum-sensing molecules that are doing all this remarkable operon-type biology in bacteria are actually having behavior modifications in the worm. So this is really uh, true inter-kingdom communication. So this nematode has been previously described as being able to detect the homoserine lactone made by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the cyclic lipopepsa pentapeptide, and also serowetin, which comes from uh, serratia marcescens, another uh, gram-negative, and 17 volatile compounds uh, produced by pathogens of nematodes, which happen to be Bacillus uh, nematocida. And so the thrust of this manuscript was to investigate the neurons that can inter integrate and process the information encoded uh, with these bacterial cues. And here, what they showed is that this nematode can interact with the CA1 signal via this, this sensory neuron, AWC on, principally by deleting various structural motifs of the autoinducer. Now, how did they do this? And so I was really intrigued to figure out how they, how they did this. And here the nematodes were grown um, on E. coli HB101. And the beauty of this JPC paper is within the methods. And they have a chemotaxis assay that I metaphorically refer to as a turtle race. And I went out and found a great resource in one of these um, videos, uh, video methods papers on how to do a chemotaxis assay for chemotaxis assay for these nematodes. And the nematodes are plated onto a nothing more than a glorified agar plate with various salts. And then one microliter of the stimulus or autoinducer and one microliter of an anesthetic. So the, the trick is you section your Petri plate and then you put your chemical to see whether it's an attractant or a repellent in a zone. And you put the worms in the middle of the plate and then you have a turtle race and you see where the worms go. If they're attracted to your molecule, they'll, of course, move to that zone. If they're repelled by your molecule, they'll remove, they'll move to the other zone. You put a defined number of animals on the plate and um, you can effectively see what's actually uh, going on. And they have a, a cute little way of, of calculating this and I'm not going to go into that great detail. They, they have a couple of positive controls that the animal likes to be attracted to. One is happens to be isoamyl alcohol. Any of you who out there who have ever done a plasma prep will immediately remember what isoamyl alcohol smells like. I'm personally not attracted to isoamyl alcohol, but these worms are. And the other positive control they used was benzaldehyde. So in the first experiment, they asked the simple question, was C. elegans attracted to the quorum sensing molecules produced by this Vibrio. And so they did this chemotractin assay and they asked the question, was it attracted to CA1? And the answer was yes. It was actually more attracted to CA1 than it was um, uh, E. coli. And so they do these assays in triplicate and they can and do powerful statistics to ask the question, what's actually going on. And so then they began to dissect things and ask the question, which portion of the molecule was the animal attracted to? Was it attracted towards the head or the hydrophobic tail? And in two of their figures, they go through a very detailed analysis of, of the chemical design of these these quorum sensing molecules asking the question, which piece of the molecule is it attracted to? And what they showed in all cases, C. elegans preferred that bacteria produce CA1 to those that do not. And they then simply asked the question, could fluids 
be, you know, the, the super Nathan, were they also as good? And it, it, it worked remarkably well because all they need to do in order to figure out if it's working is literally count the worms with their figure, with their finger, the sodium azide that they deposit in concert with their, their chemo attractant or chemo repellent. Uh, effectively anesthetizes the worm so it literally stays put once it gets to uh, the zone it's in and they do a prescribed uh, period of time leaving them sit there for um, one hour. And again, using past knowledge of, of the literature, Basler and her colleagues knew that the previous structure activity relationship and analyses demonstrated that it was indeed the CA1 receptor – that was responsible for this activity. And again, they did a number of experiments asking about uh, antagonists. Uh, they used one particular antagonist called CQS, and the, the nematode displayed a statistically similar recognition of each molecule, suggesting in this particular experiment that the head group of the molecule was not playing a role in specifying the structural requirement for chemotractant in the animal or the nematode. So this was big news. And as an antagonist, which we know turns off the Vibrio operon, where it wouldn't be um, interacting with the receptor in the bacterium, uh, it was still attractive for, for the animal. In other words, that the animal... Uh, really didn't care it was going to activate its operon. It just wanted to know their vibrio there. So then they played with the carbon tail length to try to understand what was remarkable about CA1, and they played with the number of carbons, and uh, CA1 has a 10-carbon tail, whereas the granddaddy of the quorum-sensing vibrio, Vibrio harbori, uh, produces a CA1 one type molecule that only has an eight carbon side chain and then they also made one that had nine carbons and one that had 11 and they simply learned that nine and ten carbon tails produce the most robust response from the nematode nine was about was better than eight or 11 so this parallel preference parallels the the cqs receptor they then that went to work asking the question well what What's the receptor in the animal that's um, detecting it? And again, the literature told them that this amphid sensory neuron can detect many uh, chemical stimuli. And most chemical sensory neurons in C. elegans use either a cyclic GMP-gated channel or these TRPV channels for this sensory transduction. Again, they have the advantage that C. elegans has a very developed genetic system so they can make, if you will, transgenic animals or they can make mutant animals that have mutations in this cyclic GMP gated channel. And then it's just a, a mere swapping of um, various mutants and that have various mutations in various of the cyclic GMP gated channels in order to um, assess what's actually going on. And so they had the mutants, they tested their results, and they narrowed, it, narrowed the candidate neurons down to two families, ASEL neurons and these two AWC cells. And uh, again, they made more mutants, and then they did something magic with lasers where they did laser ablation and the A1 ablated animals were not attracted to the CA1. So they literally closed the loop on the cause and effect. By the um, way, the ablation for experiment is really neat. You may want to tell how they did it. I mean, they put GFP in a specific neuron, mm -hmm. and that becomes a target for the laser. So they know where to aim it, yep. if you will. Right. To, to ablate it. They illuminate the target. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it's perfect. It's beautiful. So this is, so this is the guided so, – so you have a way of um, homing in. This is truly the guided missile, the laser-guided bomb. Yep, yep. And, and so 
summing up, this intimate relationship between C. elegans and bacteria as their food stores could require that C. elegans rely on the detection and interpretation of, of bacterial cues. This gives a whole new meaning to the expression reading the room um, because if you happen to be one of these bacillus pathogens, nematocida, you can understand how C. elegans would move away from one of these chemical cues. And so – and the, these animals do in, do indeed adapt uh, their behavior and there are many nematode genes involved in dower formation and they have been well characterized. And C. elegans uses an unknown bacterial cue or cues – to exit this metabolically arrested or dour phase and then uh, continue through this um, evolutionary and not evolutionary and through this developmental cycle. And in fact, the the C. elegans avoidance response to L1 produced small molecules is overridden. Um, and this is in one of their references by back by the addition of bacteria. Uh, uh, to the assay. In these cases, you, you see that C. elegans development and behavior and specific bacterial produced stimuli are all playing into what's actually going on with the microbes. So while we may have only thought that quorum sensing molecules were important for the bacteria to know whether or not it needs to remain in a biofilm or make a batch of virulence determinants. And this is why I went into the – planted the seed about antibiotic stewardship because if we kill off bacteria that are making quorum sensing molecules that our colonocytes happen to be responding to or in the case of, of nematodes, um, that you're, you're going to begin to change up the system. You can really change uh, the ecology of, of the local environment in which these things are present in just by adding an antibiotic and it really ties in to uh, the first paper that we discussed about how you know insects have actually pulled antibiotic genes to actually allow them to to develop properly or they're actually using antibiotics in a particular niche and and here we have microbes actually providing a quorum sensing molecule to the community at large and the nematodes are actually feeding on the livery, little Vibrio. And I, I found it curious that Vibrio was actually preferred over E. coli but then those of us who appreciate the Vibrio genome recall that Vibrio has two chromosomes. It's the heretic of the, of the bacterial world. You know, the one most – it's one of the heretics of the – bacterial world but one of its its um, chromosomes is very similar to a bacillus chromosome which is sort of an oxymoron considering vibrio is a grand you know a true gram negative and we know that bacillus is is a gram positive so i'm wondering uh where this c1 molecule is actually whether it comes off of the bacillus chromosome or whether it comes off of the Gram negative variant of the chromosome in, in Vibrio. And I didn't have an opportunity to go off and look at the Vibrio genome to see where uh, the C1 gene was located on, whether or not it was on uh, the bacillus like chromosome or the other. So to sum up, the Vibrio Colora C1, CAI1 enables this cross kingdom interaction. It's, it's a really neat paper. Uh, if you have an opportunity or you're curious about this uh, chemotaxis assay, uh, I, I put it up in the, the show notes. Uh, it was done by a team at Queen's University in Canada, and it's published in Jove.com, and it's called the C. elegans chemotaxis assay. And it's a tremendous video. You see the worms squiggling, and you see the pipetting, and it's, it's really quite remarkable to watch. Good. I I think I feel I'm missing something because is this compound 
CII1, is this found in other bacteria as well? Or is it, is it specific to Vibrio? This one happens to be specific to Vibrio. The, the compounds are similar. This, they all follow the, the canonical sequence of this homoserine lactone moiety. Uh, and that's effectively the hallmark of gram-negative okay. quorum sensing molecules. And they paste on the, on the head of the molecule was where all the business activity is. And then the polar end of it is um, effectively what uh, the worm is actually detecting. So presumably in nature, in the wild where C. elegans lives in the soil, some other bacteria is providing a, a quorum sensing molecule that has may have similar functions, right? Correct. Well, they haven't done this exhaustively, so that's likely to be the case. Because Vibrio C. elegans, are, as we said before, are not likely to interact very often. So, But Serratia certainly, yeah, Pseudomonas, cer- Pseudomonas certainly. Mm-hmm. It loves Pseudomonas. Um, and it's There's attract- lots of bacteria in the places where, where C. elegans lives, of course. C. elegans yeah. lives, so it's, it's full of bacteria. So it's just a question of doing it a little, a little bit more looking. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right, Michael. Thank you. Lovely stuff. We have a couple of emails. Um, the first one is from Dennis. Oh, uh, you know this one. I I want to wait till Michelle is here because it's about listeria. And um, she'd like to hear about it. So let's skip to David. David writes, why not eat locusts? Assuming oh, you people can... do. Yeah. People do. Chocolate covered the world where they are delicious. They fry them and eat them. Yeah, and in the old days, before people raised food and before people could catch it efficiently, they would eat locusts, yeah. But nowadays... Uh, you have to eat a lot of them to get your protein, I guess, right? I guess so. And I so I, I've been reading um, Guns, Germs, and Steel, oh. and they talk a lot about so- societies that have, you know, when they're protein starved, they eat insects and locusts when they can't get something else. But if you have animals to either catch or raise, that's pre- preferable because it's much more efficient, obviously. So uh, Dave also asks, did locust swarms function as sort of restorative wildfires? Did they leave behind a refreshing load of nitrogen and phosphate on somewhat depleted soil, preparing for a rich regrowth of the plants as they sprouted the following season? Did they serve as a restorative protein feast for creatures such as humans who may have spent years on relatively protein-poor diets? That's a good point. Good points. You know, I don't know. Uh, I don't either, but I imagine it's true with that biomass the biofilm, yeah. as Michael called it, uh, on the ground, I'm sure that contributes to the next uh, yeah. growth of plants. Absolutely. Yeah. But we are not locust experts. But those are good ideas, Dave. And uh, Dave is from Fresno, which is near you, Elio, right? No, oh, Fresno's up in San Francisco. Hey, relative it? to me, it's near him, right? That's true. <laughs> oh, the that other- is true. The last email is from Shubham, who writes, Hello, in TWIM92, you club India with Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria when talking about countries which still have cases of polio. Please note that strategies for polio eradication work when they are fully implemented. This is clearly demonstrated by India's success in stopping polio. I wish you were more kindly you're kindly more considerate when talking about countries you don't know enough about. Just because a country is poor now does not mean it takes its citizens' health any less seriously. My intention is not to offend, but rather to inform. I am offended, though, being an Indian, Indian citizen and having relatives who have worked so hard to help make India polio free. I hope you correct this in the next podcast. Well, uh, Shubham, I am offended because it's not really nice to say be more considerate when talking about countries you don't know about. I certainly don't know anything about India, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Pakistan, culturally, uh, but I do know a lot about polio. And in that episode, which I re-listened to, to uh, address your complaint, I did say in the beginning, polio only exists in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. I am well aware of that fact. Later on, I accidentally began to say India when I repeated the statement. But I think it was quite clear that I had made a mistake and only meant to indicate Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. So I have, and if you listen to any of my other podcasts and read my blog, you know I've been working on polio for over 30 years. I know I'm well aware of what's going on. And therefore, 
please be nicer when you scold us in the future because I find it offensive uh, what you said, okay? And, um, you know, the Internet is a wild place, but you have to be nice because we're trying to help people. So don't, uh, when we're wrong, we're happy to be uh, acknowledging it, but we weren't in this case. All right, that's TWIM93. You'll find this one at iTunes or microworld.org slash TWIM. And uh, do send us your questions and comments. Even when we're wrong, we appreciate it. Just be nice, okay? Send them to TWIM at TWIV.TV. And I'd like to thank everyone who is here today. Elio Schechter from Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Of course. A pleasure, as always. Michael Schmidt is at the Univers- Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. And Michelle never showed up. Too bad. I guess she <laughs> forgot. Maybe she's playing golf. We'll, no. see, her. we'll see her next not time. Like Michigan. <laughs> yes, you're right, uh, Elio. Not anymore. Yeah, I forgot. Okay. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can hear his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.